I ever bought with my own money. Um, 1973. Core, eh? Doesn't time fly? Um, I would have bought albums a lot earlier than that, but I didn't have any money. <laughs> How are you? Um, talking of money, um, <clears throat> I'm thinking of getting this sponsored so I can carry on doing it. I mean, we don't know, one, we don't know how long the pandemic's going on for, or this lockdown. Two, I've really sort of got to like it. It's fun, isn't it? It's like, I am the broadcaster here. I can say anything. Everyone, everyone can join in. No one can get offended, or they can just fuck off. Do you know what I mean? It's brilliant. It's, uh, keep it free for you. That's what I want to do, really keep it free for you. So get it sponsored by someone. I don't know how that would work. I'd quite like to do it that old fashioned way where I say, hello, welcome to load of bollocks sponsored by Jameson's, you know, smooth Irish whiskey. And I choose things that I actually like, so I wasn't lying. I'd want to say what I want about them. Pay me, they pay me if they like, do you know what I mean? And if I and I couldn't change any of the content, they can't say, "Oh, you can't talk about this." I go bo bollocks. I talk about what I want. Um, and uh, so you got to be careful where you're sponsored by, so they're not too precious. Like if you get sponsored by the Vatican, you're asking for trouble. <laughs> They'd call up one day and go, "We don't like to talk about the cock in the drain." <laughs> I go, "You changed." Um, so. <laughs> I want to be having to talk about cops in trains, alien slugs, uh, and all that shit. Um, so yeah, any companies out there want to give me 50 grand an episode? The, the, the reason is, right, is um, I feel like uh, I haven't got enough money to do the charity stuff. I've got enough money for me, more than enough money for me. But I don't think people realise how many terrible things there are happening in the world. And that's why it's got to be solved by governments and the people, not by individuals, because it's it cost billions, you know? They're chopping down rainforests. They're, we kill, uh, we kill like, I think, three billion fish and sea creatures a day, right? And most of that is ground up to pellets to feed cows. If, if you cut meat consumption by 10%, that would feed like 100 million people. It's because we use so much of the resources, we deforest them to grow um, uh, uh, things to, to feed cows do we grind up it's crazy um anyway yeah so i feel like that you know that that david bowie film the man who fell to earth when he has to come to earth and make so much money because he's got to get water to his planet so that he needs trillions that's what i feel like <laughs> oh god save all the dogs um, but people are helping, like Street Dog, you know. They, these make a... I mean, this, it is a drop in the ocean, but it's a big difference to the individual charities and the dogs they save. So, a little bit of time. So, if I can do this on, like, uh, times a thousand... <laughs> it's an idea, isn't it? It's an idea. So, yeah... Um, basically what I'm saying is it'd be free for you I'd talk bollocks and um, I'd have more money to spend on animals that's, a, that's, a, that's the, the fun isn't it? That's, what's, that's the fun you can save an animal um, anyway and uh, a nice bottle of wine <laughs> one for you one for me uh, let's get to the questions, the shitty fucking questions that you idiots 
send me. Oh, I should say hello to some people. Um, in fact, well done for winning your TV Choice Award. Thank you. Uh, second year running. Afterlife. It's up for another award, award I think. Um, it's up for... I think it's the TV Choice Awards in America. You got, I think you got and the TV Times Award as well. Anyway, there's there's always an award. There's always an award to win for me. <laughs> oh dear, still fun. Winning awards is more fun now than it was because apart from you, you, you you're proud of your thing and you know you you it's nice to win. It pisses people off. <laughs> Which is also a, such a bonus. That's such a lovely bit of collateral damage. That doing something good and winning something pisses some people off. It's double bubble. <laughs> Sydney, Australia. Hello. California. Um, uh, yeah, let's do some questions. Mrs. Scallywags. That's a cat. Straight into... Straight into the big hitters, Mrs. Scallywax. <laughs> it's called in. Mrs. Scallywax was wondering whether the painting in Afterlife, Series 1, Episode 2, where you make Lisa jump, is one of your own paintings. No, it's not. Um, it sort of looks like it, doesn't it? I sort of told him what I wanted. Uh, and there's a little, I don't know if people notice this. Again, you do all these, these things with details that no one notices. But the painting she's painting when I make her jump, the finished painting that she was painting is on the bedroom wall, which I thought was a nice touch. Because that was like, when she was painting, it was like three years ago. So, well, yeah, no one noticed. I know. Pat myself on the back. I go, good one, Rick. That's brilliant. No, no one noticed. <laughs> still it's there I still like putting in those little things in case like two toothbrushes in the in the stand I, I still like doing them just for me and if people notice then great if not uh, yeah sodger Leslie says how do you begin to cast a dog do you have a doggy audition day and what was it about auntie that made you choose to play Brandy in Alpha. Well, um, you usually they, there's professional uh, handlers, trainers that do these things. Usually the dog, they, 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 it ranges from someone just walking by with a dog to the dog's got to do stuff, like, you know, take a criminal down in a police drama or something. So you have to have people. Um, and uh, I... Uh, it usually goes through the art department to, to, to source that. And um, so I, I got a, a thing through from this this guy. His name is Ash. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's a pictures of the dogs he uses. And I chose Annie because I wanted a big, I wanted a big, robust dog um, that he had to walk and do stuff. And, you know, um, uh, and I just, I, and I wanted a dog. I just wanted a dog. For six weeks, <laughs> and I fell in love with uh, Auntie, and I met her, and uh, I played with her, and she we got on, um, and uh, yeah, uh, and I said to Ash, I said, I just wanted to be a dog. I don't want her to do tricks or stress her or do anything you know she doesn't want to do. I just wanted to be a dog and act like a dog, and act like she knows me. And, uh, um, but there's still tricks to it. Like when she has to go and sit on the grave and look at the grave. They, they, that, that takes a while. He, he has to show her where he wants her to sit and put a mark. And he's trained her over the years so she knows what he's talking about. You come here, you get... So she ran, she sat on her mark and then he stood behind the grave, behind the grave with a sausage on a, uh, a stick. And so he can make her look well, and on screen, it looks magical. That's how they get me to act, by the way. <laughs> they hold up a beer, like that. And I, I do my lines. 
Um, yeah, so that was it. Tanya, can you tell us anything about Blazing Samurai? Uh, as a film, I saw, I think I might have finished my bit. You sort of, you make it over three years where you have to keep doing, it's an animation. It's an animation uh, of, it's like a remake of Blazing Saddles, but with cats and dogs. And I'm one of the uh, uh, the voices, one of the um, uh, cats in it. Uh, and so I've I've been sort of doing my bits and pieces over the last couple of years now and again, because they get all your things and they go back and animate it and they change it and stuff. Um, and uh, it, it's funny, it's a funny script. I've got a funny part. Um, and again, they let me go crazy. Uh, so I think it'd be, it'd be fun. I think it'd be fun for all the family. Uh, but the answer is no, I can't tell you anything that you don't know. Because, yeah, you have to see it and see what you think. Lord T. Leo. Lord T. Leo? Did someone ever threaten to take you to court over a joke you made? No. No, not yet. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, luckily, I don't think you can take people to court over jokes. Not in a not in a sensible, civilized society where freedom of speech uh, is a is a cornerstone. It's getting that way. I think there was some sort of um, thing trying to be passed in Scotland that you could that you could uh, be done for. Um, Grow, being grossly offensive in a joke. I, I didn't look into it, but you can't have that. You can't, it's a nonsense. Who's to say what... I told you before, if, if, if there is a law where you can call the police if someone offends you, I'll be on the fucking phone 24-7. I will spend my entire fortune on a bank of a thousand people on phones just calling the police, saying I'm offended. What is it? Uh, fat bloke on a skateboard. Yeah, 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 he's 28. Yeah, yeah, he's dressed like a toddler and he's going up and down my street and it's like, I find it grossly offensive. All right, you see him get fucking taken away. I will complain about anything that annoys me to show what a fucking farce such a law would be that you can say something that someone finds offensive, that their feelings are more important than your freedom of speech. Um, so no, no one's ever taken me to court and uh, I'd love it. I'd fucking love it. I'd be like Lenny Bruce <laughs> doing that, doing it to the judge. Look, all I'm saying, judge, is there's a cock in a drain, right? And I'm walking past, mm, right? Imagine me having to do that in court. It's justified. <laughs> Bring it on. Um, Rosie, if you had flippers, here we go. <laughs> These questions were too sensible, weren't they? If you had flippers for feet, would you hide them from the world or embrace it by swimming around carefree? I could do both, couldn't I? I could hide it from the world, but then sneak down to a lake, take my shoes off under the water, and then and just do that. And I go, fucking hell, he's going fast. Ah. Ah, um, flippers, like big, I think I'd have to show it off, wouldn't I? How could you hide those? How big would your shoes be? <laughs> I'd go, no, I've got flipper feet. Imagine still not being a great swimmer with flipper feet. I could work in a cafe, turning over eggs. Over easy, yeah, just use my feet. Nah. Not a problem. Pancakes. Nah. Wouldn't have to use them for swimming. Could you use them for anything? No. <laughs> Just use them to make a noise. Just like, here's Ricky. Here he comes. Stonewall Rockhaven. If that is your real name. If this virus goes on for years and years, ugh. What is the future of stand-up? Good question. Are, are we looking at it? 
every comedian doing it from their home. Yeah, could be, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, some do it. It's not, it's not the same, is it, doing stand-up? It's about being there and laughing and hearing other people laugh. Otherwise, they might as well just send you an email um, uh, with a joke on it. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think this is different because this is not, it's not jokes and I don't expect an audience reaction. I'm just waffling on like a twat. Um, so this is all right, but standing there like there's a reaction, I think that's a, even if it's not interactive totally, there is a certain amount of it being there and being, you know, the excitement of the event and you're the only ones to see that particular show. But I don't know. I think it'd be fun. I think it'd go back we slowly do socially distancing gigs, which I can't do because they're already sold out. Um, if, if, if they hadn't already sold out, I would play, I would do venues at half capacity or whatever. It's just that I can't because I can't turn away half the people who had a ticket. So, um, but I think, you know, we've got the vaccination coming hopefully, or I don't know. I think it's sneak back. One thing is that, I, again, I don't know, but when you see that, the, you know, there's, they've got, you know, two metres either side of each person in the venue, but they're not wearing masks. So isn't that worse than everyone wearing a mask but being half a metre away? I don't know. I don't know the science of it, but it seems odd. And even, even then, they've got, they have to then go and use the same toilets don't they and walk through the same door i don't know i don't know maybe no one does we just have to wait and see but i think i think it'll it'll, it'll go back to if not if not it's totally the same there there will be a level of normality um it'll return i think soon i hope uh well i brought that brought the mood down there <laughs> <laughs> Also, people have got bigger problems. No one's at home going, oh, I wanted to go and see a comedian. I used to go and see a comedian once a year. What am I going to do? People are trying to feed their family. People are being made redundant, losing their fucking house. No one's sitting at home going, oh, I was meant to see Rick in three months' time. <laughs> <laughs> um, Freya. What is your favourite outtake blooper from any of your shows? Ah, oh, um, I think I've answered a question similar to this before. Um, I think I had to say my top five. Uh, uh, and I think it's probably um, me and Martin Freeman in the office when he couldn't do that. Uh, Patrick Stewart was a good one in extras. Well, he, he couldn't say, well, I say he couldn't, he could say it, but he couldn't say it without me ruining the take. <laughs> um, the caravan, I think the caravan in Derek is up there. Um, uh, the cake eating in Afterlife. The ratty and the nonce in the pub in Afterlife. Uh, David Earl saying I had to cram it up there flaccid. I mean, I think that's... Um, I think, I think it's the caravan scene in Derek. I, I just couldn't... It was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. I just couldn't do it. I don't know why. <laughs> it's so ludicrous. It's so, what he was saying is so disrespectful and shouldn't be said. It just should never be said. And that was meant to be a documentary. So this character, Kev, was saying this to the camera. <laughs> oh, God. Veronica, how hard is it for you to decide on what music to use for Afterlife? Specifically for the sad scenes. Well, it depends. Because um, I use it in two different ways. Sometimes I use it uh, um, like a, a song 
for a longer montage for them to think about that that sort of uh, like um you know rocket man where he took the heroin and he saw his wife uh, but those things are planned so I actually know what song I'm going to use and then I plan it around it so it looks, it's, you know, it's harder to do, but the payback is incredible when it's something that's, that, that was created to go, you know, to, to the lyric and the, the song and everything. Um, for the sad scenes, I don't usually do a, a song. I usually do bespoke music, which you plan and sort of orchestrate it around the gaps. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's harder in a way. That's that's harder, and there's lots of ways to do it to just to find the perfect, the perfect. I think less is more. I think I see things. There's music all the way through it, and you, in the end, you don't even notice it because it's like a fucking fridge going on. So I, I like I like um, using it to maximum effect just now and again. So it really. It really gives you a gut punch. Uh, don't that answer your question or not? Uh, Annabelle, what is more satisfying? Actually creating your own show or movie or knowing that people have been positively affected by it? Well, that's a good one. Um, well, both. I mean... If no one was physically affected by it, but it was just entertainment, that would be an achievement. You know, it's hard to write and make a show. It's hard to write and make a mediocre show. And it's really hard to make a really, really good show. And it's really hard to make a really, really good show that people are actually affected by. It because, that, I mean, it's just rare. It's just so rare. And you never know. You never know what to connect. And, and you shouldn't really do it for that reason. But... Um, I think art is to make a connection with a stranger. I think that's the most important thing about it, that it does make a connection. And for me personally, I, I'm excited about the size of the connection. When I first did The Office, um, as I've said in interviews, I, I want, I'd rather it was a million people's favourite show than 10 million people's 10th favourite show. Because I was interested about, I wanted it to affect a few people more. And you do that by, you know, trying to make it uncompromised and different. And, um, yeah. Uh, so, and the more you do that, the more original something is and the more uncompromised something is and different, I think the bigger the connection, even if it's with fewer people. So I'd say that one. And the effect that Afterlife is our people is, has, uh, has been amazing. And as I said, I've never had a reaction like it because of the emotional connection where people would come up and they'd talk about their own grief. So that has been, that's, uh, it's been a surprise and a, a pleasure. And it feels like a responsibility as well. As I said, because that happened after the first series, I thought he can't just get better. He can't snap out of it because that's not true. So uh, to the people who, who suffer, I thought, I've got a bit of a duty to make this a realistic portrayal of grief now. So, uh, I'd say that one now and now, uh, uh, you know, at this stage of my career, I think making a positive connection is is more important to me than it was. Thanks for your question. Oh, here we go. Here he is. Here he comes. It's Rupert. <sighs> Do you believe there could be a parallel universe? <laughs> Lawrence Krauss, right? Do you believe there could be a parallel universe? And in fact, right, so that's a good question. Odd from a dog, right? But then what's this nonsense? Do you believe there could be a parallel universe? And in fact, nobody dies. Ooh. Our matter just gets absorbed into the parallel universe. So he's saying now, us in this universe, we just, when we, no, we don't die, we just get absorbed into the universe. So for example, yeah, I get it, Rupert, you don't have to give me a fucking example, right? <laughs> so for example, 
David Bowie isn't actually dead, but living in an alternative life in the parallel universe. How many questions is this? Would you consider, Uncle, in producing a series that explored this, either as a drama or talk show? Or talk show? Hi, this is uh, Parallel Universe, the talk show. Um, I would watch. Fucking <laughs> 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 essay. Right, I'll be honest, Root. I'll ignore all the other shit, but to answer your first question, do I believe in a Parallel Universe? Um, there could be, that's two different questions. Ah, do you believe there could be a parallel universe? I don't understand it enough to answer that. Um, I know that it's, that it's a, it's part of the, the, because of the nature of how matter could be arranged, the particles could be arranged, like tending towards infinity. It's a number that's not even worth saying. It means fucking there's not a word for this number, right? So there's so many, I don't quite know what the theory is. I assume it's a mathematical theory as opposed to they actually think there could be lots of universes. I think they mean that the chances are there could be, right? Even that's unfathomable, that these physicists come up with these, these theories through maths, mostly. I don't even know if they mean they're next to each other or in the same space on a different plane. Um, like, I don't know whether they're saying, have you got two glasses of salt water? Have, have, have you got, a, have you got a, two different gla a glass of water and a glass of salt? Or is the salt dissolved in the water in one? Are the parallel universes a potential possibility? Or is it to be taken literally? I don't even understand the theory, so I can't answer that. Um, so I'll say no. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell, Rupert. Asking me shit like that to make me look stupid. I don't know, do I? Why are you asking me stuff about quantum physics? You idiot. Oh, here comes Joey. Oh, what's he going to do? Oh, he's done t two, hasn't he? Uh, sensible and stupid. Right, I'll do these quickly. We're running out of time, Joey. Sensible. When you're filming your shows, do you ever get the extras uh, ruining a take by laughing? Or is it always your fault? It's always my fault. It's always my fault. I don't think I've ever had to go cut that extra laugh. I think they do what they're told. They're really good. They're professional. It's, it's always my fault. <laughs> oh, dear. This stupid question is, would you rather have toes for fingers or fingers for toes? <laughs> Who's going to sponsor this shite? Now, I wanted, I wanted 50 grand from, you know, a, a big, a major company to try and save some animals and get drunk. And then you've ruined it with this shite. <laughs> you've blown you blow my big chance, Joey. <laughs> oh... Would you rather have toes for fingers or fingers for toes? Okay, let's look at this. So, so I've got fingers here and fingers on my toes, or toes, they're not swapping, and toes on my toes and toes on my fingers. I, I think I'll have fingers on toes and, and, and hands. Because if you've got, I mean, I reckon if you've got fingers for toes, you can sort of bind them and make them, you know, put them in your shoe and that'll be fine. It won't be fine, but it, but at least you've got, you've got to do stuff, haven't you? Imagine playing the guitar with fucking toes. It's hard enough with fingers. <laughs> uh, I love fingers. I love fingers for toes. And fingers for fingers. That's the choice, isn't it? Fingers everywhere or toes everywhere. I love fingers everywhere. You idiot, Joey. Right. One more question. Last question. Oh, God. It, 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 it. Right. Glenn says, you're on a raft in shark-infested waters. Right. Suddenly, two dogs frantically paddle towards you. There is room for only one on the raft. 
and the, the shark gets the other one. Which do you save and why? The dogs are Gunner and Rupert. Oh, God. Did I ask Gunner's question? Did I get a question from Gunner? Uh, I thought I had a question from Gunner. Oh, I missed it. Here's, here's Gunner's question, right? This is Gunner's quest, Gunner's question, right? He was a good boy. <laughs> <laughs> you are Gunner. Right. So, the question is, to end this, I mean, on a raft in sharky fisted water, Rupert and Gunner are swimming towards me. I can only save one. That's, I'm not answering that. Like, uh, wow. I reckon, I reckon I'd, I could safely save Gunner because there's no shark big enough to take on Rupert. <laughs> the shark would go, fuck, I can't eat that. I can't eat that. No. Fuck it. So I'd say Gunner and Rupert could just float along by the side of us to land like a like a blimp and he'd be safe. <laughs> what a load of shit this is. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, <laughs> have a great week. See you Sunday. Be nice to animals. Tatty bye everyone. Tatty bye.